Loops give you the power to process huge amounts of data with only very few lines of code. So where would B programmers be without loops? Well, on the other hand, loops can also be the reason for very, very bad performance and extremely hard to find bugs. Rust gives you three ways to loop over data, and we're going to look at all of them today. Watch till the end, where I'll give you some insight into performance and how to avoid common pitfalls. My name is Max. This is Green Tea Coding. Let's loop. This time, let's do things a bit different. We'll start with a task, and this task is going to be calculate the sum of all even numbers up to and including the number 20. And we'll see very different ways how to do this in Rust, and we'll try to get more and more optimized in terms of readability and conveying our intent. So the first way we can do this is with the very simple loop statement. We'll create two variables. One is our sum. The other one is the current number that we're going to sum up. And of course, the sum is going to start off with zero. And our first number that we want to sum up is, of course, the number two. Then we'll have this loop construct. And everything that is in curly braces will be looped indefinitely, except for if we hit a break statement. If we hit a break statement, this will move us right to the next line after the loop. And in this case, the logic is, if we have arrived at a number that is greater than 20, we've definitely finished and we're going to break and we're going to print the result. Otherwise, we're going to sum up the current number that we have and increment our number by 2 because then we'll have all the even numbers. Of course, when we run this, we get the correct result of 110. While this loop statement works and is probably also very efficient, it doesn't really convey our intent very well, in my opinion. If we just see this loop statement, the reader knows, OK, this is going to be looped maybe indefinitely and is a bug. Maybe it's going to break at some points. Maybe it has five break statements in there. Who knows? Of course, with our five lines of code here, this is very simple to understand. But imagine that you'll have a loop that goes over hundreds of lines of code this is going to be a real pain to find out how often this loop is going to be run and what the break statements are. So something that conveys our intent very clearly here, or much more clearly, would be a while loop. Of course, we need to initiate our two variables, sum and number. And then we'll have this while statement. And before the opening curly brace, we will have our condition on how long this while loop is going to run. In this case, the condition is the number needs to be smaller than or equal to 20. And once we're in the loop, we'll do nothing else but sum up and increment our number by 2. And now you can see already in the first line, whoever reads the statement knows, OK, this is a loop that loops until my number reached a number that is greater than 20. The functionality, of course, is going to be exactly the same. We get 110 as our answer. Well, we can still do better, of course. The next thing that's going to convey our intent even more clearly is a for loop. A for loop is something that you would use if you know exactly what range of numbers you're iterating over. And this is actually the case here. So we'll have this head of the loop reading for i in to up to and including 20. This is what the equal sign is for. Then, when we're in the loop, of course, we have to check now whether we are at an even number or not. So this is kind of the drawback that we have. Because the for loop will go through every single number, we also have uneven numbers, and we have to check whether we are at an uneven number. And this is what we're going to do here. The modular operator here does something like saying, OK, divide i by 2 and give me the rest. If the rest is not equal to 0, then we know we are at an uneven number and we continue. Continue in this case means that we will jump to the header of the for loop. The for loop will then go to the next number in this range and will loop again. Of course, the next number after an uneven number will be an even number, so we will always continue into this sum statement then, which will sum up the even numbers. Of course, we get the same result here. And now you could say, well, this has not really been an improvement was it? Because before here, our loop body had two statements, and now we have four lines again. 
Well, of course, Rust has another ace up its sleeve. We can include a step size for our for loop. So the only thing we changed here is we had some parentheses around this range, meaning that now we want to have a method that acts on the whole range. And this method is called step by. And in this case, we have a step width of two, meaning that now the header of our for loop conveys almost the full intent of what we're trying to do. We're going through a range starting at two, up to and including in 20, and we step with a width of two. The only thing that's left for the reader to understand is now the loop body, and this is just an easy summing up of the values. Of course, this will also work. So what if I tell you that we can do even better? Actually, we can condense this whole statement into one line of code, which will be very idiomatic rest and read almost like prose. So what we do here is we directly assign sum to the following statement. Again, this is the part that we already know, stepping from two up to and including 20 by a width of two. And then we just have this dot sum, which sums up all the values. So this is the most idiomatic way to write this. And this is actually part of what makes functional programming, which Rust embraces almost fully, so nice. Now you could say, well, it's all nice, but we've just worked on a list of numbers that we can describe analytically, all even numbers from two to 20. What do I do if I just have a big collection of numbers that has no rule to go by? Well, that's not hard at all. Let's look at numbers here. I have chosen some random numbers to be in there and we will just do the exact same thing that we did before. We have a sum variable, we say for n in numbers, we'll just sum up the n and we'll get the result. And of course, we could also do this with our dot sum method. In this case, just note that we need the dot iter function, which will create an iterator over this numbers array. Don't worry too much about iterators now. We will definitely come back to them later in other videos because they are a fundamental concept in Rust and one reason why Rust is so great to work with. And this is exactly the point where you should be asking, hey Max, what about performance? Does it matter which kind of loop construct I use? Well, of course, I did some research before recording this video, so let's hop into the slidecast. So in order to gauge performance of all of those different kinds of looping that I showed you, I wrote three very simple programs that all do the same things, which is I instantiated a vector with a lot of random numbers, and then I summed them up. The first one you can see here is the range-based for loop. Then in the middle, we have the index-based for loop. And on the right-hand side, we have the while loop. And now for the big surprise. Even though the while loop and the index-based for loop performed basically the same, I had an around 5x runtime increase when I used the range-based for loop. And I was very intrigued by that because if you read the Rust documentation, you will find that iterators, which are used under the hood for a range-based for loop, should be a zero cost abstraction. And zero cost in this case, meaning we have no runtime overhead. So what went wrong with this statement? Well, if you unroll the loop in your mind, you will have something like this. First, n is assigned to nums at the index zero, then you sum up n. Then n is assigned nums at index one, and then again, you sum up n. So what happens here is we create copies. n is being copied from nums at index zero. Why? Well, because n in this case is an i32, so a 32-bit signed integer, and this is copyable, so Rust will automatically take a copy. So our assignment copies a 32-bit integer, and therefore the header of the loop also creates a lot of copies. And of course, copying is very, very costly. So this is where the overhead and runtime comes from. The solution to this is very simple. We just need to add one additional symbol, which is, of course, the reference in front of nums. In this case, if you unroll mentally this loop, 
you will see that every time we go through the header of this loop, we will just create a reference to nums at the corresponding index. And lo and behold, after this change, our results are that all of those loops perform exactly equal. So overall, it doesn't really matter what kind of loop you use, but be sure to not make any unnecessary copies. Now that you know so much about loops, the following task is going to be very simple for you, right? Your coworker says to you, man, I've got a lot of words here and I don't know how to make a sentence from it, like in a programmatic way, right? So these are the words that I have. And I've already included the spaces to make it easier for you to concatenate them. And you say, okay, no problem. Let's just generate a new string, which is empty and call it sentence. And then we will loop with a range-based for loop for s in words and say sentence dot push string and we give a reference to s and in the end we will print the sentence so let's see we get this is sparta nice however 10 minutes later your coworker comes into your office and says well the sentence is correct but somehow i can't use my words anymore now and he shows you the following line he just tries to print line, the words were, and we'll again use this debug operator here to print out the words. And in fact, Rust doesn't compile this line of code anymore. What happened? Well, let's see, the compiler is our best friend, at least most of the time. And it says words moved due to this implicit call to into iter. And the value borrowed here was after move. Okay, so what happened here is that this construct leads to Rust under the hood calling the intuiter method on words. And this is a method that might consume the original data structure, in this case an array, and create some iterators from it. Those iterators were then moved into S because of ownership and how ownership works, which means S has now ownership of the individual words but S will go out of scope at the end of this curly brace in our for loop, meaning that the data will be lost. And this is exactly what happened here, right? Words is no longer available because it has been moved bit by bit into S and disappeared into the nether. So of course, as you now know from my example with the numbers, the way to fix this is adding an ampersand here so that we will just go with references to strings instead of ownership to strings. And of course now this whole thing compiles again and we can see the individual words. So evening is coming, you're thinking about the day, you're thinking about this code and something just doesn't feel right. This is Sparta. Kind of a lifeless phrase, isn't it? This needs to be shouted. You saw the fill? Well, let's do this. Pick up a mute in front of words and we'll have an extra loop here for s in. And in this case, we're going to take a mutable reference to the words because we want to make them all uppercase. And we'll say s equals s dot to uppercase. Very handy function here from Rust. But wait, why doesn't that compile? Oh, OK. Again, compiler, our best friend says consider dereferencing here to assign to the mutably borrowed value. This is because s is now a reference and we cannot assign to a reference. We can only assign to a value, meaning we need to dereference here and this is being done via the asterisk operator. And now we're assigning to a string and not to a reference of a string. So keep that in mind. If you want to assign to something that is a reference, dereference it first. And now let's see if our efforts worked out. In fact, this is Sparta is now the correct phrase. If you followed my tutorial series, then by now you should know about variables, different data structures, and how to loop over those data structures. Additionally, you know how to modularize your code with functions. So this is most of what you will need to write almost any program. So why continue now? Well, even though it is possible to write almost every program with those tools under your belt now, 
There is a lot of ways you can nicer structure things and give a boost to performance and readability. So keep following along and we'll look into all of those things that make life at Arrestation better. So see you in the next tutorial video with Green Tea Coding.